Welcome, I'm John Glanville, and this is video 47 in my Calmness in Mind series where we explore common sense solutions for your calmer life. And I've called this video Boundaries of Responsibility, the Dilemma of Being a Nice Person and Doing the Right Thing. <laughs> and if I were to ask my body's brain to use its unconscious database recording and patch and matching skills to look back and analyze the many thousands of intelligent yet anxious people that I've worked with, I think here are some of the things that it would report back to me. It would say that intelligent individuals with complex personalities and those who had a desire to make a difference or to engage with the world are more likely to develop complex anxiety than those who are less intelligent and have a more straightforward personality. I think those people, whether they realize it or not, are the ones that are helping to evolve the human race through their deep thinking, through their creativity, through their creative, creative imagination, through their passion and through their inner drive. And, and be that through traveling, teaching, building companies, raising families, having fun, building strong, supportive communities, no matter what they do. But seemingly, the world we live in doesn't always support those who strive to make positive changes, or those who wish to simply use common sense to simplify outdated traditions um, or bureaucracy. I think these complex personalities, they feel they have an inner sense of responsibility to do something. You know? um, whilst all around them, less responsible people add to their burden and the government limits their freedom to be able to just take responsibility for themselves and for others through their actions. I think other comments my brain would report back to my conscious mind, so my observer could become aware of it on my mind screen, would be that they often experienced difficulty depending on others. It's not that they didn't necessarily trust others, but it was often quicker or more efficient to do things themselves so that they could ensure things were done as effectively as they wish them to be. I suppose at one level this usefulness and this willingness to help um, is a good thing. But if that need were to become overdeveloped, it may lead to obsessive or controlling behaviours based on good intentions, but they just get a bit out of control, especially when viewed from a less responsible person's perspective. I presume these dominant and controlling actions actions enabled them to do things well, so they'd be liked, so they could help others, so they could be of value, make a difference, and ultimately so that they could feel good about themselves. The people I worked with, they often told me that they felt a bit different from others. Um, sometimes a little awkward, uh, more excessively prone to worry, and where possible they tried to avoid or minimize um, conflict uh, preferring to seek security, certainty, um, and reassurance. Phrases that they would often use to describe themselves included the words uh, doubtful, indecisive, fearful, tired, confused, frustrated, overwhelmed, um, and angry. And they told me that they felt driven to do what they believed was right, whatever that was, for themselves and those around them, and that just being themselves was often an exhausting, exhausting experience because it was so complicated because they felt that they had so many responsibilities. But ironically, in about 80% of instances, that anxious person was usually competent in an emergency situation or the type of person that others would turn to for advice or assistance. Now, this really fascinated me. How could an anxious uh, doubtful and worried person who dislikes conflict be effective and take control in an emergency situation? <laughs> well, I believe the answer is quite simple. I think that during moments of imminent danger or emergency, these individuals are forced to stop thinking and to instead just instinctively feel or just know or to intuit okay, what is right for that unique situation. I think their brains momentarily don't have time to doubt themselves or to talk themselves into or out of taking action 
And what happens is their natural dominance arises. And they shift away from their highly developed and overdeveloped conscious, what if logical thinking brain and revert to more natural, innate, unconscious responses. It could be said that they just trusted themselves instinctually in those moments. Um, common sense or the energy of nature guided them to more appropriate responses. But if you think about this, can you see the folly of this behavior? When everything is okay, they worry and get anxious, yet when everything goes wrong, they step up and sort things out. <laughs> and I think these people step up because they care. And they care because they feel responsible. And because they feel responsible, they go the extra mile to try and get agreeable outcomes for themselves and for those that they feel responsible for. So in this video, I'm exploring how you might become more consciously aware of where your chosen boundaries of responsibility are, because that will offer you the opportunity to let go of worrying about things that are not your responsibility or things that you just can't control. And you'll also be able to become more discerning of where you willingly choose to place your attention and use your valuable resources of time and energy each day. Now, I'm not suggesting that you become cold and heartless, but I do like Shakespeare's advice, to thy own self be true. Are you taking responsibility for other people's happiness, happiness, your extended family, outcomes at work, the plight of animals, climate change, inflation, wars, and other things that are just not directly your responsibility? Because if they were your responsibility, you'd be a politician, um, a carer, an inventor, a manufacturer, or an activist out doing what needs to be done. And if you, if you care, but you can't change those things, though they still hold significance for you, might it be beneficial for your peace of mind to temporarily release your sense of obligation yeah, and set those matters aside until you have more time and energy to revisit them later. So can you spend time now working on saving your energy, recharging your system, and becoming the new you that we have talked about so much throughout this course? Or even if you do feel some responsibility for an issue, if you are doing your best for it, and given how much time and resources you have, can you accept that and can you detach from any further emotional burden? What I mean is, just because that bad thing is happening, do you need to feel bad? Especially if you've done all you can do, or even if you've chosen to do nothing. Could you learn how to have calm, non-emotional, detached, yet honest compassion without the associated virtual guilt from feeling responsible for something that you didn't do or can't even control? Let me try and give you some examples. Um, many of my clients over time have become really close friends and we share a deep and enduring bond because we spoke honestly about each other's lives. We shared lots of personal information. And I think we became friends because I was honest with them and they felt that they could be honest with me. And when I told them about my mental health issues, I think they related to what I was saying. And as I told them stories of what I learned and how I changed my attitudes and my beliefs and my intentions, and, and I told the stories, explained to them the stories I told myself about myself. And as I switched from pessimism to optimism, from doubt to trust, what they said to me was that it just felt right. But as a therapist in training, I was instructed to maintain professional boundaries with clients. And this included refraining from sharing personal information, uh, avoiding personal relationships, keeping professional demeanor, and avoiding physical contact, such as hugging. And I was told it was my responsibility to adhere to these guidelines. 
And my left brain and my logical intellect, they could understand what they were saying. But my right brain, my essence, my instinct, my, my heart and my soul, thought those responsibilities to be irrational. Right? As it was from my experiences that I could prove that I understood them. And if a person in front of me was in distress, surely it was the right and the human thing to do to, to hug and to comfort them. So it seems to me that in Western cultures, this logical and rational intellectual part of our brain, it seems to have become deeply overconditioned with stories about who we ought to be and what we ought to do and what is right and wrong, what is true and false. And I think this causes our sense of responsibility to be far more idealized and far more programmed than perhaps it needs to be. So I'm asking you to consider what are your boundaries of responsibility, where they might lie. And not just within your family, job, relationships and community. How much responsibility will you accept for your own physical and mental health? How much responsibility will you accept for your happiness? And basically, your whole life experience. When I first became a therapist, I felt it was my responsibility to help everybody. <laughs> and in my naivety, I thought the measure of my success was how well that person became after working with me. However, I soon realized that only about 20% of the clients were actually prepared to put in the required effort to become a new person. And the other 80% wanted me to fix them, but seemingly without them having to do the exposure therapy work, um, or they were being forced to see me by a family member who was at the end of their tether. So after a few years, I had to ask myself where I would set the boundaries of my responsibility, what I would accept responsibility for, and what I wouldn't accept responsibility for, so my mental health and my happiness could be managed. Let me try and give you an example. I decided that I would only work with people being sent to me if I could also work with the person who sent them as well. Because usually they were the primary carer and I needed to offer them new forms of care and reassurance in line with the process that I was teaching. Now this really shocked a lot of carers when they discovered that to some degree they may be the cause or at least a contributing factor to the first person's issues. And I then began telling potential clients upon my first contact with them that my work was very truthful which might feel a bit blunt, it might feel a bit in your face. And it required a lot of soul searching and it required a lot of homework and there's a lot of videos to watch. And that if they weren't prepared to do that work, then I was probably the wrong therapist for them. And my strategy for my own well-being was to try and attract clients who were interesting and willing to put into the effort as that would be more stimulating and more fulfilling for me. And additionally, I aim to sort of deter clients who tended to play the victim card or those living in an environment that would make it difficult for them to ever change, as these clients would be exhausting for me to work with, um, thus um, bad for my mental health. So um, I use the marketing tagline, sensible help for intelligent people who want to change, on my website to broadcast my intentions to potential clients. And if ever argumentative, boring or victim type clients called me, or if I just felt like I didn't connect with them, I would tell them that I was fully booked and then I would just refer them to another local therapist. And I think this is a good example of where the truth can sometimes be a lie. Because it was a lie that I was fully booked. However, I was being true to my emotional health to not work with these people. <laughs> After a couple of years, that other therapist who I'd been referring to rang me up and she wanted to thank me for all the referrals I'd given her. And she asked me if I could have a, a session with her. Um, because she said that though she believed she was a good therapist, she wasn't seeing the changes that she expected in her clients. And when she was in my office, I told her that I'd only sent her um, the people who I didn't want to work with. And she said to me, 
well, how could I have known what they would be like to work with if I hadn't actually worked with them? And I told her that they just didn't feel right for me. And she said to me, well, John, that's not very scientific. But when I asked her how they had been, you know, um, she said to me, actually, they were very difficult clients who resisted change. So I explained to her that whenever I took on a new client, I always told them right up front that it's not my responsibility to fix you. That's your responsibility. But it was my responsibility to be present, high energy, happy, optimistic, educated, and prepared to help you and understand yourself and to give you the appropriate tools and techniques that will allow you to change yourself. And she said, wow, that's so different from me. I feel it's my responsibility to help everybody who calls me and I've never turned anybody away. So I went on to explain that though some people didn't like to hear this, all I was doing was telling the truth about my self-defined boundaries of responsibility so they could make decisions based on facts and not on their assumptions. I would also tell them that I only required the headlines from their traumas, not all the details, because I didn't want them to be rerunning those old stories because that would only reinforce those old thought patterns. And I certainly didn't want their traumas to be visualized within my brain, which would likely trigger my emotions and detract me from objective responses. Because constantly rerunning stories of past traumas often quickly cycle out of control into loops of thinking and then their corresponding emotions, which then the intellect tries to make sense of. But the truth is, at one level, there's nothing to make sense of. Yes, that bad thing happened. Yes, it was horrible. And yes, it was unfair. And yes, it shouldn't have happened. And yes, they should have known better. And yes, it wasn't your fault. But here we are five, 10, 20 years later, still unconsciously abusing ourselves with the same old stories and getting the same old emotions and asking the same old questions. And it's exhausting. And for some people, when they're ready, it can be empowering for them to wake up to the fact that maybe the bigger abuse was the one that they're doing to themselves each day by clinging to and reliving those past stories and identifying with the out-of-date associated sense of self derived from them. Now, obviously, I'm not condoning any bad traumas that were inflicted upon you. However, the reason we can now choose to forgive people yeah, or to forgive ourselves is that it's time to stop abusing ourselves with past stories of guilt, shame and regret. And revisiting or constantly experiencing those heavy emotions, it's like walking through treacle. It's cloying, destructive, exhausting, and it serves no purpose. And these days, I truly believe that you can be an empath. You can be a sensitive person without having to feel or experience another person's pain. I've found it possible to define a boundary of responsibility within oneself where you can resist having your energy drawn from you but you can still be present, compassionate, and helpful. And of course, at the other end of the scale, if you can become a high energy person with a discharged atomic battery and a fully charged emotional battery, it might be your pleasure to share your energizing life force with other people. Now, initially, I had to fight my inner resistance to this seemingly brutal full of honest, form of honest interaction because so much of my childhood domestication was to be nice, to be helpful, to be a people pleaser and to follow the rules. But over time, this being honest exposure therapy became easier as my new belief systems rolled over into becoming automated programs that just ran from my unconscious brain. I just naturally told my truth in each moment of each day to the best of my abilities and I didn't let my out-of-date stories of who I ought to be or what I thought I ought to do cloud my judgment. So much so that these days I would think it ridiculous to do something I didn't believe in or to do something that I just didn't want to do. Even if everybody around me was doing one thing, if my inner truth was different or if it felt wrong, I would calmly and politely stand my ground 
to the best of my ability. And this exposure therapy taught me how to speak my truth, to speak with common sense, and to ignore all the old conditioned stories of my brain and the stories of everybody around me. And I wasn't doing these things to change other people. I was just learning how to live my life in line with my truths as I, as I had defined them to be as an adult rather than living from the ones that were programmed into my brain as a child. So therefore, evaluating your boundaries of responsibility will help you to find and to speak your truth, which will over time train other people to treat you differently. Because if others really know how you feel, then at least one half of that interaction is based in truth, and the truth normally feels right. And it seems to me that truth is not a thought. Truth is a core feeling deep inside, and it's an energy aligned with your intuition. Now, I'm not saying that you should do what I do. I'm not even saying that this is the truth of anything. I'm just describing a model that worked well for me and asking you, what can you try for yourself? And because we're all different, we'll all have different realizations. And as I did this work, I found that my natural dominance and my natural playfulness, which for some reason had been suppressed as a child, could now be re-engaged with. And it felt surprisingly natural. And see, there's that word again, it felt right. I didn't need lots of left brain logic and reason to justify a behavior that just felt right. Could I be true to myself without having to justify it to myself with logic and reason from my overdeveloped left brain intellect? Could I be happy just because I decided to be? Uh, to say no just because it felt right in that moment? To love fully without needing anything in return? And to not have to analyze each moment or live up to some conditioned story of who I thought I ought to be? I hope this is making sense. So I believe there's a strong correlation between responsibility and truth. And both are deeply influenced by what you feel to be right, not necessarily what your programmed brain thinks to be right. And of course, in the beginning, this is hard. Because for many anxious people, their feelings are scary and overwhelming. However, as they step into their truth, and as they use the ERP techniques that I teach, emotions can be learned to live with, they can be accepted, and they can be rapidly recalibrated if you do the work. Therefore, by examining what you're prepared to take responsibility for, and by speaking with honesty to yourself and to others, though hard initially, ultimately it makes life a lot less stressful. It saves a lot of energy. It recharges your batteries and it enables you to communicate your true desires more effectively to those around you. And what happens is people begin to sense you differently and they begin to respond differently to you because their bubble of energy, when it interacts with your bubble of energy, senses calmness and love, fun and integrity and it becomes energized by that higher frequency, which affects how their brains respond back to you. And all this happens beneath the overdeveloped left brain intellect, which is trying to justify and understand what it thinks to be true and correct. And I think it's a very powerful and valuable contemplation to sit and meditate on what the word truth means to you, or what the right thing to do is or how truth can even be proved or tested. Yet our left brain logic holds truth as a seemingly solid um, concept. I think that at best, you would need to define clear perspectives, um, context, and the content of a situation to elicit the truth from that orientation of that particular happening, because every moment in life is completely different. So rather than wasting your life trying to understand and live up to somebody else's definition of truth, why not go inside your head and find and define your own inner truth? Who do you wish to become? And what do you wish to do? 
and which new truths might tell yourself, might you tell yourself for your new inner reality to become more beautiful. Do you remember in video 45 where I said that for me, my reality was my inner reality and that my primary intention for my life was to make that inner reality as calm and as beautiful as possible by using every technique available. Even if it was a fib, it could still be my truth to lie to myself with integrity and in a loving way until these new, more loving stories were adopted by my unconscious to become the new operating system of my brain. And remember, this course is about finding calmness by understanding who you are, by considering who you wish to become, by retraining your brain and your body, by becoming a new person with more precise intentions. And therefore, how might your truth be defined from the context of this new perspective? It's not about how we cling to our old stories. It's about how we let go and try new things. Now, one helpful starting point is to explore if you use any statements like these. Well, if I don't do it, nobody else will. Or, well, they just can't manage on their own. Or, it's just who I am. Or if you say things like, well, it's just hard for me to say no. Or, um, our family has always done it that way. Can you see that though these may be true, they are not necessarily the whole truth. Because if you don't do it, somebody eventually will, somebody else will do it, but they'll probably do it their way and not yours. And if they think they can manage on their own, perhaps let them you know, pull back. Maybe they can, uh, maybe they can't. It's their responsibility to discover, not necessarily yours. And who you are, um, is that who you have to be? Yeah. Um, and why is it so hard for you to say no? Well, perhaps some of the problem is that you're taking responsibility for things that are not really your responsibility or not necessarily your desire to do. And just because your family always did it that way, perhaps that's just a sentimental conditioned habit. Perhaps another dream could be what new traditions or behaviors would you wish for your daughter to pass on to her daughter that she will learn from watching you performing your new behaviors right now. So it's my experience that many of life's dilemmas can be quite simply eased by deciding where your boundaries of responsibility start and where they finish and then honestly communicating this through your words and through your actions. I remember hearing the phrase, saying no to them is saying yes to yourself. And he's thinking, wow, that's so obvious. Why have I never looked at life in this simple way before? And if my brain were to analyze uh, great people like Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, it tells me that these were just normal people who, who did outstanding things in common sense ways by selfishly doing what they believed in, taking responsibility for their actions and always speaking their truth. And I guess, though their lives must have been tough, I would imagine they would have had a deep sense of purpose, um, of meaning, of fulfillment, and a deep respect for themselves within their heart, which nobody could ever take away from them. Just through common sense, love, honesty, and action, they left a huge footprint on this planet. And I think in any journey of change, and you wouldn't be watching this if you didn't want change, I think we must make time to selfishly put our needs first. And if you have an issue with the word selfish, perhaps meditate on that too. Because if anybody calls you selfish, what they're saying is, you're placing your attention on you when you should be placing it on me. <laughs> Therefore, that other person might be either very needy or unknowingly quite narcissistic. I think that being selfish to the degree that you can find calmness, wellness and direction will allow you to be there for those you ultimately choose to take responsibility for and surely that's a beautiful thing. So, spending time really pondering 
what you're prepared to take responsibility for and what you won't, I believe is a fascinating exercise. Especially if you then share your decisions with those around you so they are aware of how you are intending to change your life. With my partner Jen, though her happiness is her responsibility, I choose to take responsibility to, for trying to create an environment around her conducive to her well-being. I aim to take responsibility for the part I can influence and I check in from time to time to honestly see how I'm doing and to check to see if her needs have changed. Therefore, I'm taking responsibility for keeping my behaviors up to date and truthfully telling her what I require for my happiness so she can do the same for me should she wish. I try to take full responsibility for myself for taking the actions that pro will propel my life towards my intentions, like um, learning, like relaxing, like building a home, earning money, having a social life, um, and becoming as creative as I can, be, I can be. But I don't take responsibility for the outcomes of those actions, because how could I? And I've learned to stop listening to the part of my brain that says I ought to do anything, because that was just an old, out-of-date program. Now, I know I've said this many times across this course, but I think it's worth repeating one more time. It's a common trait amongst anxious people to wait until they're certain something will work before they take action, rather than just taking action to see if something will work. So therefore, this exercise of contemplating where you choose to define your boundaries of responsibility can hugely reduce what you need to do uh, and what you need to worry about. I think our left brain's intelligent addiction to facts, knowledge, and the need for certainty, um, which in theory offers the individual the perception of safety or doing the right thing, may in some part come from our Western schooling protocols. Our schools rewarded those students who had good memories that could rigidly apply what they'd been taught and could repeat back all those facts in exams uh, and who even debated those around them, influencing them to also believe in what they had been taught was actually true. You might say this type of person had a high IQ, their, their intelligent quotient, which was derived from a sense of standardized tests to access human intelligence. But those tests, they don't account for something called EQ, which is emotional intelligence, which we might define as the ability to effectively manage emotions, to relieve stress, to communicate clearly, to empathize with others, to overcome challenges and to resolve conflicts in possible ways. So I believe that intelligence should be viewed on a broad spectrum from an academic science professor at one end to an uneducated but street smart shopkeeper at the other. It takes a lot of skill to do either job very well. Both are very clever. Though one is manipulating words and numbers and data, which responds well to the identified laws of nature, whilst the other is com influencing complex biological balls of energy, which we call humans, with their thoughts and feelings that could change in a second, um, which can't be defined by science, but are still absolutely true. Imagine how effective an individual might become if they could do both, like an introverted, shy, egghead scientist who became comfortable socializing, making presentations, um, asking for research grants, and motivating a team to help him achieve his goals. And I believe we can learn how to slide ourselves across that scale of left brain analyzing when we need it, to right brain sensing and connection when we need it and to not get caught up in trying to understand why everything works. And I think this emotional flexibility, it tends to bring on more calmness and it helps us to make better, well-considered decisions. Now, as I've said before, one of the best representations of this, symbolic representations, is from the TV comedy, The Big Bang Theory, expressed by the relationship between the characters Leonard and Penny where he, as a physicist, has a high IQ, 
and she a high EQ as a waitress aspiring to be an actress. They're both extremely intelligent, but in very different ways. And the more that they learn from each other, and the more that they learn from each other, the scientist learns how to be more social and competent, and Penny learns that her emotional intelligence is the common sense energy that feels more than thinks, which enhances communication, relieves stress, and sorts out people's problems. And it's my experience that about 80% of the clients I attract have both high IQ and EQ. But learning how to balance these two radically different and competing inner modalities, one of thinking and one of feeling, is key to their future well-being. My experience also tells me that only about 20% of these clients actually do the intense work required to fully make that happen. So an interesting question is to ask, what are that successful 20% doing which allows them to change, which the other 80% fail to do or unconsciously sabotage themselves from doing? Perhaps another way to state that is, why do you take the actions you take? Why do you do what you do? Yeah. And where does that need to take responsibility, where does it come from? Is it from the left brain guidance that you ought to follow the truth of, of what your domestication or what your classical education conditioned you with? Or is it because you intuit or desire to take responsibility for something or somebody? And I think people are slowly waking up to the fact that we're made of energy, that we live in a sea of energy. Motivation is energy. Love is energy. Creativity and action are energy. And our brain is just an organ in our body which sits in this field of energy in the darkness of our skull, guessing what advice it should give us in any moment. And yes, your brain can advise you from all its left brain, five cents rich data and past experiences, but it can also advise you from intuition and feedback from local energized energy fields read from the people around you. And this is no less scientific just more right-brained, non-linear, and harder for science to currently prove. And it's my experience that those who take responsibility for what they feel, you know, what they feel passionate about doing, what they desire to do, they bring that passion, that desire and energy and that momentum into the things which they do do, which often expires the others around them. You might say it energizes them. So I'm urging you to consider that where you set your, your inner reality, boundaries of responsibility, is a fundamental step in finding more calmness. And I think it will also offer you the opportunity to be more honest with yourself and others. And as I've said all through this course, anxiety makes you fib. It makes you fib to yourself and it makes you fib to others, okay? Whereas the truth will set you free. But finding what that truth is, or finding what your truth is the first step. So, what I'd like to do now is to jump to another hypothesis of mine, based on everything I've learned over the last two decades, which I can't prove is true, <laughs> uh, which science can't prove is true, but it's still true for me. Do you remember back in video 16 where I talked about our DNA birth personalities of warrior, settler, and nomad? And that amongst any group of two-year-olds, there are about 80% natural warriors and nomads, dominant and or imaginative and playful, with the more sensitive 20% of settlers in the minority. Just a few children on the sidelines who are scared to run free and naturally join in and express themselves. However, when all those children reached uh, the age of 16 and had been domesticated by their parents, by their schools and by their culture, about 80% would think and behave and identify as settlers and just 20% would have retained their instinctual warrior or nomad tendencies and probably wouldn't have had too many mental health issues. However, of that 80% of conditioned settlers, 
many of whom would be experiencing mental health issues, it's my estimation that about 20% of them will have anxiety due to either their dominant warrior feeling disempowered and out of control, their ADD hedonistic nomad being bored and not getting out enough, yeah, or not having a creative outlet, or their taking excessive and often unnecessary responsibility for everybody's protection or happiness and not telling themselves the truth about how they genuinely feel and what they genuinely want from other people and from themselves. And isn't this fascinating? How nature loves that 80-20 ratio split. We see it everywhere. 20% of people own 80% of the land. 20% of athletes win 80% of the games. 80% of revenue comes from 20% of customers and 20% of healthcare patients use 80% of healthcare resources. And I believe this ratio of nature, though not scientific, it appears to be true. And it's first observed by an Italian economist and engineer called Pareto. And it's since been labeled as Pareto's 80-20 law. And I see this clearly in my own company. 80% of the questions I'm asked come from 20% of my clients. And 20% of my people watch 80% of the videos. So what are these 20% doing that achieve incredible changes in their mental health that the others are not. And it's my first observation, is that they get bone-crushingly honest with themselves and those around them about who they wish to become, what they will tolerate, what needs to change, and what needs to be moved away from in their lives. And this honesty brings up another blunt but honest consideration for anybody doing this type of work. And that is, are you currently ready or able to make the required changes? Is it the right time? Yeah. Is somebody else wishing you to change, but you don't want to? Have you decided that looking after others is more important to you than how you currently live your life just now? Yeah. Do you want to change, but aren't prepared to put the required effort in just now? Now, I think these are honest questions you need to consider to deep, deeply and to, to answer honestly. Are you willing to change your job? Are you willing to leave an unfulfilling relationship? Are you prepared to become more social or to remove yourself from people who suck your energy or abuse you? Now, I'm not stupid. I know these actions will likely cause major discomfort in the now. But downstream, um, the rewards, I promise you, will be worth it as you orientate yourself onto your new true path now rather than regretting it later. Or perhaps you are a true settler and will be willingly and lovingly in service to others. Or perhaps you're an old school sensitive empath and you still feel you must bear everybody else's pain. Um, perhaps you're completely left brain you love to live in your mind and go down all the rabbit holes that may uh, find answers but stopping you from taking action in your life. Can you see it could be that radical honesty will tell you you currently aren't ready for change? Which is fine because then you can just accept where you are and know that you have made the decision to not change. And sometimes that can be quite liberating. You can choose to be single. Um, in a bad job or an unhealthy relationship, but accept that for now, that's your choice. That can let go of a lot of responsibility. And I think for 80% of people, change is just too overwhelming, or their family or the situation is just too controlling that, that it stops them from being able to change whilst living in that environment. But before you give up and accept your plight, I suggest that you experiment with finding your dominant warrior's voice or your playful nomad's fun selfishness and allow your settler to be more honest about what you desire to do and what you know you must stop doing. But for everybody else, I think waking up to the realization that you are responsible for your life can be far more accessible than we were ever taught. 
Now, as I know how hard it is to break out of the conditioned settler mindset, mindset, I would like to give you some ideas that may help you to get out of the details of the content, uh, you know, uh, up into the context of your situation. And to do this, I will share my tiara model with you, where the T stands for triggers. Have you worked on desensitizing that which triggers your mind and your body into fear and pulls you away from taking action? The I stands for intentions. Have you decided what you wish to do, or at least who you wish to become? The A stands for actions. Are you taking actions towards those intentions? And the R stands for responsibility. Are you taking responsibility for your life? Or are you deferring to others or spending your life protecting others? And finally, the last A stands for accountability. Are you making yourself accountable for your dreams by sharing your intentions and your plans with others or asking for the help that you might require and taking those leaps of faith that will force you to change, like leaving an abusive job or going back to work, but in ways that will work for this new you? Can you, with sincerity, self-love and honesty, say, yes, I'm doing everything feasibly possible in line with these perspectives for this moment and for my future better life? Can you honestly say to yourself, yes, I'm aware of how my unconscious brain tries to sabotage me, and, and rather than identifying with that old story, I will birth or EIP a new belief uh, a new behavior into my brain, which will initially feel awkward, but will recalibrate to be my new normal. You could say, to build back better. Does that ring any bells? Because it should. As this form of mind control, this form of mind conditioning or self-hypnosis is extremely powerful and is being applied to you all day long from TV, films, the news, social media, and it has been most of your life. But there's no need to get upset or angry. The solution is quite simple. You just need to work a little harder on reprogramming yourself on what you desire. As the rider of your horse, you must program it rather than unknowingly have your little horsey pulled this way and that way by the needs of others. Can you honestly say to yourself, yes, I am procrastinating right now? Can you be honest with yourself and yes, say yes, I do distract myself from taking the actions I know I'm required to take? Or can you raise your hand you know, and say, I'd rather somebody else took away all my responsibilities because I don't know what I want. So for now, I'll just conform, I'll just fit in, I'll just do what's needed and I'll relinquish my brain's exha exhausting, I'm supposed to do this forms of responsibility you know and what I'll do is I will take this little respite to recharge to regroup and to reflect before I'm ready to try again later because at least then you have your truth available to you and from this point you can decide to take more responsibility or just defer it out to others and let it go I think both are equally valid options because there's no right way to do anything it's just that your conditioned brain makes you think that there is. Now this model can also be expanded whereby if you're honest and say, upon consideration, I can't or don't want to do it, or even I'm not ready yet, I think this can be temporarily very liberated. You're not yet a queen who wears the crown of responsibility. Instead, you're still the immature princess so therefore, you have a decision to make. Will you accept and enjoy being the princess for now, aware that there is more work to do, but the time isn't right, so you can let go of feelings of responsibility and control, you can have some fun, you can learn new things, or simply allow others to take responsibility for you. It can be very, very freeing. Or you might choose to acknowledge that you are the center of your universe. You are the rider of your horse. You are the king or the queen of your life. And you make that powerful transition that only 20% of people are courageous enough to do. You move from princess to queen, from prince to king. 
and all I'm here to tell you is, though hard, it's a good journey. And ultimately, it's worth the effort because responsibility leads to meaning and the truth sets you free eventually. And it's my experience that using your imagination within your inner reality to create these new, more optimistic and truthful dreams on your mind screen will enhance your ability to keep lovingly and courageously talking yourself into doing what you know will be best for your life. And surely that's the most beautiful gift any person can bestow upon themselves and surely is the definition of unconditional love. <laughs> I like Princess to Queen and Prince to King metaphors because our soul can so clearly articulate between which thoughts and behaviors are naive and princely and which ones are solid and kingly based on the new inner truth. And so they simply guide us to make decisions from that new perspective. The princess is exploring who she is, whereas the queen has found herself. She knows who she is and what she wants, and she speaks truthfully and takes responsibility for her actions toward her best life and that of those around her while still respecting that they are responsible for their lives too. So no matter what happens in our outer reality, if we can govern the inner one, then mostly all is well. And my life changed radically once I stepped up and allowed my king to run this inner domain, where before the prince who meant well, but was too egotistically susceptible and hadn't yet learned how life works, therefore was caught up in his left brain thinking and his animal horsey desires. So, I would suggest that you jump back to watch video 16 again, then videos 29 and 32 parts one and two, as these will help you to explore truth and responsibility. Then you decide, will you remain a prince or do the hard work to become the king? Will you become a settler queen with a hint of warrior? Or will you become a warrior queen of integrity and action? Might you become a nomad queen that lives in the now, creating, inspiring, and bringing joys to others? Only you will know, as this is your life, this is your dream, and this is your responsibility. And one last observation, my life changed for the better once I stopped trying to be a nice person and became a good person. And when I discovered that there is no right or wrong way to do anything, each moment is unique. Each person is different. One size does not fit all. And underneath all my left brain conditioned thinking was nature's field of energy that would, nature's field of energy that would intuitively communicate with me if I could only shut up long enough to sense it and to trust it. Okay, uh, lots to think about as usual, but I think these are valuable things for us to consider. Let me, get on, let me know how you get on with taking responsibility and speaking your truth, and I will see you shortly in the next video. Thank you all very much indeed.